All right, welcome to session 11. We are in our series on church planting basics, and uh, this week is essentially kind of part two of last week's uh, lecture, going from vision to movement, um, as you can see here on the screen. So we're talking about the phases or the stages of planting a church. Last week we discussed through the uh, different analogies, human uh, growth analogy from like conception all, through, all the way through adulthood and reproduction. Talk about how plants, we use church planting as an idea, but, but it's in this, you know, planting a seed and watching it grow and the fruit multiply and so forth. And we looked at various uh, models that show the stages and we condensed them down to the one that we're going to use for this class, uh, which is basically going from envisioning to preparing to launching, establishing, and repeating. And uh, what I want to really focus on today is to take each of these parts, these five parts, break them down a little bit further, uh, and then also show how they're really a holistic piece. And so when we're thinking through things like uh, planting a church, we're not just focusing on one step at a time and uh, assuming that they just stop. So when we're in the envisioning phase, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking, okay, here's what the church plan is going to look like down the road, or here's... Here's what we can do you know, for our city, that sort of thing. Well, you're always having to envision, even five, six years into your ministry, you're envisioning, okay, how do we expand, or what new ministries do we need to start? Uh, what do we, how, how do we partner with the community uh, for ministry? So you're always envisioning, and you're always preparing. Uh, when you're doing new ministry, you're always going to be getting new leaders ready for things. Uh, maybe your church decides, you know what, we really need to start a Sunday school or some type of small group ministry in homes or whichever it is. Well, you're preparing people for that, even though you're not preparing them to start a new church, you're preparing them for a new ministry. Uh, you're always launching. You know, you're going to be launching new ministries, new initiatives, that sort of thing. And so you're always starting something new. You don't want to start too much, but you're always going to be in this starting phase where you're uh, prepare and get a new ministry ready, a new youth ministry, for instance, and then you'll launch it and get it ready. And then you're going to take that ministry and you're going to establish it. You want to try to grow it. You want to get the right leadership. Make sure everyone knows their roles and that sort of thing. And so, uh, and, and get to a new ministry, you want to repeat. So this applies for things more than just planting a church and starting a new work. It applies to what you do inside of your church as well. And so today I want us to kind of see this holistic picture for following uh, this um, diagram to really see how uh, we don't really stop doing this. It's always this continual circle of going back and forth through envisioning, preparing, launching, establishing, and repeating, whether it's a large-scale multiplying churches or small-scale multiplying ministries. So let's uh, go ahead and dig right in. Remember, we want to go from here, uh, a uh, established church, we have gone through this, but we don't want to stop here. We want to get to where it multiplies. So we're going from a vision into a movement. Now the movement is here on the outsides. Our movements are happening as our church is helping to mobilize and prepare and send people out to plant new ministries, new churches, uh, even maybe new nonprofits. Uh, it may not be that your church is just starting other churches. It could be you're starting a new parachurch ministry that really that your city really needs, or an orphanage, or something like that. So there's all kinds of options you can really do. But when you're looking at going from a vision to a movement in church planting, you want to start with the one, but you don't want to stop there. You want to keep it going. So let's look now at our various church planting phases. We're going to start with envisioning. And here you, what you want to notice is the um, three things, pray, explore, and discern. And so when you're envisioning, you get this idea in your head. You're thinking through, uh, how am I praying for this new effort? Um, you're, you're thinking through, what areas do I need to explore? Uh, am I discerning the right thing? And so in the envisioning process, uh, as you're praying, you're exploring, and you're discerning, you're looking at the what. So the what is, what are you starting? Are you starting a church? Are you starting a new ministry? Are you starting a new small group? You know, what are you starting? Are you, are you bathing that in prayer? Are you exploring what you need to be starting? Uh, starting? Are you discerning uh, the best approach? And, and what is it that God's really calling you to start in this community uh, from your church? Also in the envisioning time, you're asking why. What is your heart behind this vision? Uh, do you want to start a new church in your community because all the other churches are doing it wrongly? That was my uh, assumption and, and thinking uh, years ago uh, before uh, God's grace and, and love and some good mentors really helped me through. But uh, don't plant churches because all the other churches are doing it wrong. 
plant a church because your church sees a need in a certain side of town or another city or another country. So you want to assess and pray through and explore and discern why are you doing this. You also want to start thinking of where. where what, what city, community, neighborhood, country, what context, people group, all those type of things. Where is God sending you? Uh, my wife and I, we have looked at several different places from here in Winston-Salem to the Raleigh-Durham, North Carolina area. Even our hometown, a small little town of Hamlet, population 6,000, uh, that really lacks uh, a lot of gospel-centered churches. We've even explored places like Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, Montreal, Quebec, and Canada. Uh, so we have prayed through, we've even explored, we did a vision trip to Boston. We met with planters, we talked with them, we said, you know, are we a good fit for this city? What's the need here? And got, got a, a feel of the place. Uh, and then we had a lot of discerning, a lot of talking with our mentors, our pastors, uh, friends, family, just really discerning and baiting in prayer, studying the scripture, trying to see where God's leading us. And at the moment, He's kept us here in Winston Salem, so that's what we're sticking with. You also are asking when. Now, this has so many factors. You know, the when can affect you know your family. If you have a family of five, the timing may be a little different. Um, you, if you're a single guy and you're just ready to go, you can move pretty quickly. But if you have a few kids and your wife maybe has a, a job or you're, if you're helping a team and your husband has a job, it may be difficult to leave. And so the timing of when to do, um, you know, you want to give years. You want to give space for God to really teach you, to uh, bring some others in your life, to help you build and prepare and, and get your family established. You want to make sure that your spouse is on board with this vision that is your vision and not uh, it is your vision together, not just yours individually. Uh, you're looking at when to move to this new place. Uh, if my wife and I were going to go to Boston, we had to you know, decide are we going to try to go fairly soon before we have children, or are we going to wait uh, after uh, school is done, or maybe we've had some more debts paid off. And there's all kind of questions and factors that go into the timing. And you're also looking at, well, when are we going to launch the church? Uh, when is the best time to do that? Um, and you also want to look at with whom. When you're in the envisioning process, you're also meeting with people who could be on your planting team. You might meet a guy uh, who's going to be one of your elders. You might meet a lady who's going to coordinate some special ministry for you. You need to start asking, well, who am I going to be doing this with? And what do we need to be doing and thinking now? How are we praying together? How are we exploring together? How are we discerning together? So you want to be asking all these questions when you're in the envisioning phase. You don't want to get too carried away. You don't want to... Um, have such a big vision in your head that the vision keeps growing but it becomes impossible to do. You want to have a vision that's doable. You want to meet with other planters in that area. Let's say you do determine your location. Well, you know what? You need to talk with pastors and leaders and Christians there in that location and say, okay, listen, we think God is calling us to your city. How can we step alongside you and help? You're not going to come in on the, the, the you know, knight in shining armor on the white horse and uh, come in and you know, because you're here, the city now is going to know Jesus. Uh, probably not going to happen. You need to step in and start building partnerships and relationships with churches, other Christians. If you're a part of a certain denomination and they have some type of group or association there, you want to partner with them and connect with them. Uh, I've known so many uh, planters and churches that have gone to a place and say, you know, we can do it, uh, we don't need anybody's help, and they floundered. Uh, they are no longer a church, or they're struggling, or maybe they are growing, but every other church dislikes them uh, because they came in thinking uh, in a very arrogant way, we're here to save the city, where it's going to take the church as a whole in that particular area to reach that city. And so you want to start developing some partnerships. Um, this is going to come in handy when you're raising funds, if you're going to uh, uh, do a full face support. Uh, for, for getting there, which we're going to talk about that later. But uh, you want to develop partnerships who can maybe help fund you, who can support your uh, mission and your vision uh, through financial means. And like I said, with other churches and uh, Christians. All right, prepare. So in the preparing phase, you're doing these three things. You're researching, you're enlisting, and you're gathering. Now remember, this list is not exhaustive, but for your test, you do need to know uh, these three. And for each slide, I would know the three that are in and be able to explain a little bit. Um, 
But in the preparing phase, you're researching. You're asking questions like, well, what does this community need? You're, you're still assessing different locations. The preparing doesn't mean you've nailed down a city. Let's say you're looking at Boston and Winston-Salem, for instance. Okay, well, what does Boston need as far as church is concerned, and what does Winston-Salem need? What does this community need? And maybe we say, you know what, we want to be on the south side of Winston-Salem. Well, what does that community need? So you're researching, you're looking at demographics. You look, you are meeting with other pastors and leaders and uh, other groups who are in that city already, and it can give you some insight. Uh, you're on the street meeting with the locals who live there who aren't believers and may become future uh, participants in your church. Uh, you're researching. Uh, you're studying the context to determine your approach or your model. Uh, in next uh, semester's class, we'll look at various models or approaches to church planning. And some guys, like myself, we get a model in our head that we think, oh, this is the right one, it's perfect, it's going to work, and we get so stuck that we forget that we're not starting a certain kind of church, we're starting Christ Church. And so how it looks is really dependent on the context. You let your context determine your approach, not the other way around. You may say, you know what, I really believe in the uh, missional community idea of church where uh, we start with kind of home groups that are missional communities. We uh, multiply those, and after we get three or four, then we start having a Sunday gathering, and then we multiply that, which I think is a fantastic approach. But it doesn't work everywhere. It works really well in places like Tacoma, Washington, and Seattle, and Portland, and some of the larger cities, but it's probably not going to work in, in a rural town in Georgia or South Carolina. They're going to want to see a building. They may even want to see a steeple. Uh, the people may be used to meeting. Uh, I had a friend who was a, uh, he is a planter in New Orleans and a very Catholic uh, background city. And so in New Orleans, he started with the missional community idea where they were meeting in homes. They had three different missional communities, about 15, 20 people, and they were getting together every other Sunday for worship. So one Sunday, they were having the missional community gatherings. The next Sunday, they were having their uh, worship gathering with the three groups coming together at one location. Well, in a, in a town that historically Catholic, the non-believers that they were rubbing shoulders and getting to know had no clue and thought they were crazy for not doing something every Sunday because they were used to Mass at the Catholic Church being every Sunday morning. And so the community, the context, really needed a church that met every week. And so that church, my friend's church, they started meeting uh, on the gathering every Sunday morning and started doing their missional community groups throughout the week on a various night. Their context determined their approach. So we're going to get more into that as we progress through this course. Uh, you're looking at other things in, in enlisting. You're, you're beginning to make disciples from the harvest, engaging lost people in that community. Uh, by this point, in the preparing, you may have already moved there. If not, maybe you're gathering some disciples who you will take to move there. Um, but maybe, let's say you have gotten onto the ground, you're, you're living in that area, and you are making disciples from the harvest. You are rubbing shoulders with people who don't know Christ. You're uh, sharing the gospel. You're making, maturing, and multiplying disciples. And then you're enlisting them to help you in your ministries. Uh, wouldn't it be beautiful to start a church that uh, the, the 20 people in the core group, 15 of them uh, have, are, are new Christians who became believers because of your work of loving your community and the other Christians in your group doing the same and actually plant a church from the harvest and not one where all the disgruntled Christians from every other church came. I think that's a beautiful vision. I think it needs to be part of your visioning process. So you're enlisting, enlisting new disciples to be part of this new church, but you may even be enlisting uh, uh, committed Christians who are joining you in this vision. Uh, I believe in team planting. Uh, I would not go and take my wife and family to Boston to plant uh, without having some type of team going with me, whether that was a team that I developed here in North Carolina and took, or we moved up there, got jobs, and built our team from uh, churches that we partnered with up there. Different ways of doing it. So you're enlisting new disciples from the harvest and mature Christians who can help you in making and maturing more, more disciples. You're also enlisting churches to partner. We talked about this a second ago, and you're envisioning, you're developing those partnerships. What does it look like to have four or five who say, we, you, know, you ask, will you give us some people, maybe give us some finances? Can we rent your facility for six months, or how can we partner together? Well, in the preparing you're doing this, you're enlisting these churches and getting a list, and, and you're saying, will you please commit to help us for two years, or until we get launched, or uh, two years after we get launched? All kind of different approaches, and each church is going to want to partner with you differently. Uh, you're also asking when or how often should our core group meet. 
you've got 15, 20, maybe 30 people getting together. Well, do you want them all meeting every Sunday as like their own uh, Bible study? Or do you meet once a month? You're, you're deciding those things in the preparing phase because you're getting ready. You're building this momentum. You're preparing your people uh, for ministry. And that takes time to build that core group and that team. Uh, but you're also doing something very essential. You're building a disciple-making culture. You know, we've talked so much about making, maturing, and multiplying disciples. Well, everyone in your group needs to be on board with this. They need to see that their mission is the Great Commission, not just yours. So you're building this culture of disciple-making where everyday Christians in your church, the everyday members, they're, they're not elders, they're not even deacons, they're just there and they're loving you and loving Jesus. They need to have this mindset of multiplying disciples for Christ. So that is our preparing phase. We're getting things ready for starting this new church. And I will say as we're uh, talking about approaches and models, a lot of the, the secrets we're discussing, the envisioning, preparing, um, and the uh, launching, establishing, repeating, your approach or your model is largely going to determine how you prepare. It's going to affect uh, the churches that will partner with you. They may not agree with your approach and they think it's not going to work in our city. We can't work with you. Well, that may or may not be right. Um, how are you going to uh, gather? When? How often? Those things really depend on your approach or model. If you have a more traditional approach where you say we are building up to a launch service, we have to have 200 people at our first uh, church uh, launch, and we're going to do it on Easter Sunday. Many churches start that way, and they build and have a great momentum and start. But some start very organically. They are years of just uh, discipling and building small groups, almost like a house church network. And then they decide, you know what, our best model for this context is to stay a house church network. And so one pastor is shepherding seven or eight other key leaders who are investing in the people who come to their home, but they only meet three or four times a year as a larger group. This is happening all over the country. So your approach or model really will determine uh, the rest of it. It's going to affect how you launch, what you're launching. Is it a public worship service or is it another home group? You know, there's different things uh, to, to factor in when you're looking at uh, preparing. And the model approaches and your context really determine and help shape that a lot. Now remember, in next semester, in the next class, when we talk about the strategic planning and the different methods for planting churches, we're going to break down each of these even fuller. So we're going to have full lectures and sessions and weeks discussing what does it mean to study context, what does it mean to build a disciple-making culture, how to find and secure partnerships, how to raise funds, how do you assess a community and do your research. Um, we're going to be breaking that down a lot more completely um, in the next class. And this past semester, we've really only touched the envisioning, looking at you know, discerning your calling, uh, discerning your uh, character, your capabilities, your praying over that. So that's really this, uh, this semester. We're going to break down the next four uh, in the next class period. So let's go on to launching. All right, the big day is coming. Whatever it is you're launching, with a public worship service or another set of groups or missional communities, whichever it is, you're getting ready to launch. So with that, uh, as you're preparing uh, beforehand, before the big launch day, you're organizing. You're getting things ready, like your, your church governance. is going to be elder-led, uh, one pastor with a team of deacons. Is it going to be congregational-led? You're, you're determining those things based on uh, your analysis of Scripture and the group consensus. Uh, you're looking at systems and protocols. Uh, you, you're, you'll be making uh, uh, documents like bylaws and a church constitution. You'll be looking for 501c3 status as a nonprofit in your community. Um, you're going to be going through, uh, when we have a kids' ministry, how our kids want to check in. And you're, so you're, you're laying out all these details, all these systems and protocols. You're looking at finances. How are we going to set up our budget for our church? How are we going to uh, finance our ministry and what we plan to do? Depending on your approach or your model, it's going to determine how much finances you need. If you're starting a network of house churches, your finances are going to be very minimum. Uh, those groups, there's no building to maintain, there's not ministries and, and things, to, uh, events to, to pay for, so to speak. But if you're starting a more traditional style of a church, then you do have to organize your budget to make sure it fits with uh, what it is you're starting. You also look at your organizational chart. If you have a, let's say you have a team of pastors, you have three or four elders, well, who's in charge of what? Who oversees the deacons, or which of the deacons oversee the kids' ministry and the youth ministry and the community partnerships? So you're, you're organizing these things with the core group that you're getting ready to launch with. And you're also looking at things like marketing. Um, uh, now, 
I'm a little bit less on the um, personally for the marketing side. I think some churches, you know, they do really big billboards and commercials and all this, and spend a lot of money on advertising. And I really think that each individual Christian living their life as a gospel-centered believer is the best advertisement. And I think if we're, if your church is doing that, that disciple-making missional culture, you don't need to really market and pay for these things. But some churches do. It's not wrong to do at all. In some places, it's probably a really good strategy. But you're looking at your church name. Uh, your, your context and your approach will determine even you know, uh, your church name. You don't want to uh, go to a city like Boston and uh, call it the Atlanta Braves Christian Church. Uh, that's not a very good thing to do uh, with Fenway right down the street. Uh, so that's a horrible church name. Don't, please don't use that. Uh, but you're looking through your, your church name. You're, th you're thinking through a logo that fits with that name. What kind of branding ideas are you looking at? Uh, are you going to have a website? Are you going to have social media? All those type of things. Start laying those out before the launch. Now, when it comes to time, well, all these different phases, some of these are months, some of these are years. This preparing for launch, you're doing this for months. You're probably doing this for probably one to two years that you are preparing for the launch. So they're preparing, the envisioning, preparing. This is kind of at that maybe one to two year phase, really depending, um, especially if you do it from scratch or out of another church. And so in the time frame, you're not rushing through these, but these are different factors you're thinking through as you're preparing this several month, maybe even years process of planning and starting a new church. Delegating. Delegating is something that guys like me don't like to do. I don't like to give up jobs in ministry. I think I can do it the best. And so I go and do it, and then I burn out. Nothing gets done, and ministries fail. Okay, so delegating. You want to be delegating tasks to your leaders and those members, those, those who you've been preparing and enlisting uh, from the previous stage. You're now getting to a point where you are delegating roles for them, and especially for the launch day. Uh, if on your launch Sunday, if you're going to have a kids' ministry, and you're going to have people in the parking lot, make sure people get to the right places. Well, you need to have people who you have delegated to oversee those various ministries. And you need to decide that before the launch day, who is going to be doing what, and make sure that they are equipped for doing their role when the church launches. You don't want to say, hey, uh, Bill, how about you lead our kids' ministry? See you later. When Bill says, well, I don't have kids. I don't know what to do. I'm a lumberjack. Uh, I guess we can play with axes maybe and cut some trees down. Bill probably should not head up your kids' ministry. But if he was prepared and equipped, he very well may get in. Um, and then you're going to look at your start. When's that, when that big day? Uh, different church uh, planting leaders and, and directors have different ideas. Uh, you'll often hear that Easter Sunday or sometime early in September are kind of the hot spots to launch your church. And Easter, because it's culturally here in North America, uh, people will just flock to church on Easter. Um, and you, you have you know, churches swell in numbers with visitors and guests, and for many, that's the only time they'll come through the church door. Uh, but if it's that one time and they come for the very first time, they say, hey, a new church down the street, it's Easter, I guess I'll take my, you know, do my Christian duty and take my family to church the one time a year that God wants me to. And, but then they get there and they hear the gospel, and it grips their heart, and they rededicate themselves to gospel mission and, and to a church. Well, that, that's one of the reasons why Easter may be a good time. You often hear uh, September. Uh, summer's over, you know, people done with vacation, done with moving around, and school is getting back up, it kind of fits the school schedule. So an early September, close to Labor Day, is often another popular time uh, for launching. And some churches just do it whenever they have things ready. Uh, they pick a time, February, March, July, whenever, they pick a time that really fits them best. So that's what I'll say. Let your context and your model really help influence and determine uh, when you're actually going to start this church. Now remember, if your approach is very decentralized, house church network or missional communities, you're not really launching the big service, so to speak. Maybe that will come later, but maybe you're launching a new group. So do you have a goal of saying every six months we want to start a new group of 15 to 20 people? We want to be multiplying those groups. That helps keep accountability and mission, and it gives your people something to look forward to as well. So this is the launching phase. Now let's turn our attention to establishing. This is the church has started, things are starting to grow, uh, the, the elders and pastors and, and, and deacons and the laity, they're getting used to their roles, they're understanding things, they start to develop a rhythm. Okay? They get into this rhythm of, okay, every Sunday morning we are gathering around 11 o'clock for our worship, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday nights is when our home groups are meeting, 
uh, our Sunday school was happening. Um, you know, once a month we're doing this very specific community outreach where, um, you know, three of our uh, small groups or Sunday school classes are engaging and loving on this local school and, you know, they've got this calendar going. And so when you're developing this rhythm for a church, and each church is going to be different, uh, more commonly you're going to see the, the, the key common factor is going to be worshiping on Sunday, Sunday night, Sunday morning. Most churches, some are doing Saturday night, nothing wrong with that, I don't think. Um, I think there's some biblical um, precedence for a meeting on a Sunday because the, the Lord's Day when he rose. But if a church meets on Saturday night because of, of the, the building, location, or the context, the gospel is being proclaimed and the church is being built. Uh, I say we don't, uh, don't, don't get onto them for that, of course. Um, so in your rhythm, you're looking at things like you know, your calendar of your church. When are things happening? The calendar for each group. You're looking at your regular events or your, your schedule. How often are we going to do uh, a, a church-wide dinner or a picnic or whichever? Uh, but also in this establishing, you're, you're becoming a church. You're becoming known in the community. So you're, again, developing partners. So you'll see I have a common theme throughout much of this that partnership is key, and I really believe in working together. But let's say your church is now three, four, five, six years old. You need to start developing partnerships with the community to see what the community needs. Right? You talk with the, the mayor, the local school uh, superintendent, or uh, leaders of local nonprofits. Find out what the community needs. Because as you're getting established, your budget is becoming established, your people are getting used to ministry and disciple making, they're getting ready. Well, it's time to really show our community that we love them and we are here for them for the sake of the gospel. So in your community, you're building relationships. You're also partnering with other churches. You're maybe helping a, a church that is struggling. Maybe it's a mile or two down the road and they've only got 15 people in a large building and you've been renting a space and it's time to start maybe talking about merging. Your church, this has happened uh, here in, in our city in recent years where a church had about 20 people, a large facility, a younger new church plant was meeting downtown. They said, hey, why don't you come up here? So they actually st the church started a new campus on the north side of town, this other location. So they have two campuses now with two uh, different uh, teaching pastors who are both elders. And the, uh, the older church that had been around for over 100 years gave them the building, merged with them, said, you, you completely take over, we're going to have your name, you do whatever you want to do to the property, and just gave it away and joined them in their mission. It was a beautiful marriage, a beautiful merger. Um, our church is an active church planting and revitalizing, uh, revitalizing church, and we have now have two um, churches that are, one's about 70 years old, others close to 100 years old, that are just struggling, and they have come and reached out to us for some type of help. And we're talking about how we can partner with them and take care of them, maybe give them some people, help them with some resources, and see what we can do together because our city is big enough that one church cannot do it all alone. So we're partnering with churches. We're also partnering with our denomination. Um, if you're, unless you're non-denominational, you may be partnering with a, a local network or agency or, or uh, a network of church plants or something like that. Um, but you're associating with a larger group that may or may not uh, be quite as local, maybe even more of a national. Uh, I'm in the Southern Baptist Convention, and part of the uh, part of that we have the North Carolina has its own Baptist State Convention, and our church partners with them on, on a denominational level. Uh, we share resources, we glean from their leaders, and uh, they help us, and we have this really good back and forth. But in your establishment, you're you're, you're solidifying these partnerships and you're expanding them uh, because you want to say, you know what, maybe we can partner with another church um, over here that we can send to another community and our churches together can do more for the gospel in our area than we can separate. You're also looking at people's roles. The roles of your members or your partners, the roles of your staff, your day-to-day -day office staff or uh, pastoral staff, you, you know, each elder. Here you're looking at prophet, priest, and king. Remember we talked about that? So which, which of your elders is the prophet, the lead teaching guy, vision guy? Which one's your priest? He's the pastoral care, taking care of the people. Who's your king? Make sure the administration and the bills are being paid. Uh, you're looking at your deacons. Are uh, your deacons understanding their role of serving and leading in the church in a serving capacity? Um, if you're a church that has a deacon board that helps with leadership, do they understand their role alongside the pastor? Um, and I'll put it on here. Remember APEST, Apostles, Prophets, Evangelists, Shepherds, and Teachers from Ephesians 4. Uh, study that, keep that in mind, because when you're deciding roles, things like this and the spiritual gifts inventory, assessing strengths, things we talked about in calling will even come into play for all of your people. Uh, remember, you're always equipping people 
for ministry. That's Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. And like always, we are fostering a disciple-making culture. So as you're establishing, never lose that. Don't get to the point where you launch a church and two years later, mission has died because, well, we launched, we're good. No, no, we want to go from vision to movement, not vision to one church. We don't want to go to just, just planting and launching that one church service. We want to think movement. So we have to always be thinking that how we are strengthening what we're establishing, but also helping our new church plants that we're going to repeat here in a second. How do we help those establish? So the roles of, of helping uh, change a little bit. All right, finally, repeat. We go through everything, we need to do it again. So we start back with envisioning. We come right back to it. All right, we have our church. We've been around for a few years. It's time to see where in our community we need another church or in another city or another country, whichever it is. You're envisioning who has God given us and where do we need to mobilize them for gospel ministry. So you're praying again for when and where God would have your church multiply. And you're praying for the right leaders to come through that you can develop. Uh, you're exploring again local, national, global context. Where is God leading us to plant? Is it going to be here in our backyard? Are we, willing to, are we willing to do that? I hope we are. Are we going to plant here in our city down the street? Are we going to plant the next town over, the next state? Are we going to plant uh, in, in Canada or Alaska or Hawaii? Or are we going to, when are we going to start thinking internationally and, and plant in a place like Dubai and London and Paris and some other places? So you're exploring all of these again. Remember, this sounds a lot like the envisioning because that's what we're going back to. Uh, but you're also preparing again. This time you're not preparing a core group for that one launch service, but you're preparing... Uh, you're preparing a team of leaders and lay people to be sent. So you're training and you're equipping them uh, for this new work. And you're also, with those, instilling a disciple-making culture so, so that they can, in turn, replicate and do the same thing. And here's something that a lot of churches struggle with, and I've had so many friends who were in a church, they were leading a ministry well, they had a burden to be sent and go do a new work, and the pastor uh, or the, the elders of the church, they just were not ready to release them. They said, no, no, you're too good, you're too valuable, we've got to keep you. I think that's rather simple. I think you need to send your best and let God bring you another person that you can raise up and train and then send out. If you've got someone that, that is wired and needs to be sent from your church to do a new work of ministry or to even maybe go and revitalize a church or to go be part of another church's launch team, send your best. We have to start collaborating and sacrificially sharing even our church resources. So, Send your best and be generous with your resources. Put into your budget money that you're going to help this new church when you're repeating. And then instill that culture in them as well. Put into, um, make, you know, downsize some of your classroom space or whichever. Send them tables and chairs and PA systems and everything. Send your resources with them. And watch, watch how God will beautifully restore that back for you as you are faithful to help uh, start this new church. And so, sending. That's, that's the, the, the last part here of repeating that you're sending them. And guess what? Your church goes right back to envision, prepare, and then send. And so, as we looked at all this, let me get this erased. As we close, I want you to notice a few things. You probably remember that in the establishing phase or maybe in the launching phase or one of the phases, we maybe didn't talk about prayer. It, it wasn't listed on the screen or maybe we didn't talk about a few of these other ideas. But here are some things, as you can tell, as we're going through this process, as we're going through uh, planting these churches, we're doing it over and over again, we're training other churches to do it. As we keep doing this, there are certain things that really need to surround our efforts, surround this going from a vision to a movement. So we're thinking through being, making sure that we are Christ-centered. <coughs> making sure that Christ and proclaiming His name is the center goal of this church through every phase. We want to make sure that we are having a disciple-making culture, that we are focusing on the Great Commission, that our people understand that we exist for the sake of Christ and the, and the, and the sake of the people who do not know Christ in this community. So you're constantly instilling this disciple-making culture along every phase. 
And of course, in every phase, you're praying like crazy. You are praying, you're pouring your heart out, you're begging God for the right people, the right resources, the right answers and discernment. You're praying the launch service goes well. You're praying for those churches that you're sending out. You're praying for as your people are growing and becoming established. You're always bathing every portion of your ministry in prayer and with Scripture. You're constantly going back to Scripture to make sure that you're aligning up with doctrine, that you're doing things that follow really good biblical patterns. You also want to season your church planning uh, efforts and vision with love. You want to make sure that you're loving a community, but you're loving the people that you're taking alongside with you on the mission. You're wanting to care for them. You're having uh, make sure that the, the people in your church, their people, they're struggling. They have sin issues. They have messy lives. You want to make sure they're being taken care of. Humility. Like I said, don't go into a city thinking you're it. You're going to rescue this town because you're going to plant the church that this city needs. That is anti-humility. We call that pride and arrogance. When you come into a context, a new city, new community, you're partnering with other churches, other Christians, denominations, have it seasoned with humility. Because you have to realize you cannot, you and your church cannot reach your city alone. It will take collaboration. It's also going to take sacrifice. You're giving your best people. You're giving your resources. You're giving your time. You're expending copious amounts of energy, time, resources, and people in order to see your idea go from this vision to a movement. And then you're instilling these principles into that next group. You're always evaluating. You're always looking at what are we doing well? What are we not doing well? How are we going to adjust what we're doing? Every single phase from envisioning to preparing to launching, establishing. You know, in your vision, you want to evaluate your vision. Is it gospel-centered? Does it fit the context? You, and you're preparing. Are we preparing people the right way? Launching. Are we ready to launch this church or to start uh, the, the new worship gathering? Um, are we really growing healthy? Are we establish, establishing our people for ministry in the community? Are we doing that well? So you're always evaluating, you're always adjusting, and this requires flexibility. It requires for you as a leader to be flexible and to also instill your people to be flexible. Uh, playing a new church, if you have a, a core group who are going, going through all these phases we do to help you with the launch and then also to help you to establish, this could be one, two, or three year time frame. You know, what if this is a three year endeavor? That's going to test their patience. They're having families and kids. They're getting new jobs. They're having to sell their homes. It's all kind of things. So you're instilling in them flexibility, but you yourself are, are ensuring that you're being, uh, uh, being flexible as well. And you're also relying on the Holy Spirit. You know, the church in Acts uh, would not have happened if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. And so we are relying on the Holy Spirit to guide us, to always help us in our evaluation, to make sure we're humble, we're loving, we're bathing things in prayer. And so the Holy Spirit is the, 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 the driving force in the book of Acts that led from uh, Peter's sermon at Pentecost to the gospel going out to the known world by Acts 28. And so it was the Holy Spirit driving that, and He's still at work in our churches today. And you also want to make sure your church do all this pr uh, process um, and even in the repeating, that you're doing the, the practicing the one another, so you're loving one another, taking care of one another. There's, I think, 31 or so one another passages in the Bible. And you want to make sure that your church is practicing those because you're taking care of this church that God has given you. And so this is just a quick overview snapshot of going into what it means to go from a vision to a movement, the, the phases or the stages. And so next week we want to finish looking at a vision for your city. So we're going to kind of go back to the envision part, but I want to expand your vision to really understand the dynamics of a, of a movement. What is involved in a movement? And you'll see this uh, little hashtag here, EMWC. It says for every man, woman, and child. Is your vision to plant a church that you can pastor and get a good paycheck or have some notoriety and write all the books later? If that's your vision, good luck. But if your vision is that every man, woman, and child in that city or community you're going to has repeated opportunities to hear, see, and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ through your mobilized church, then you're on to a vision. So next week we want to talk about what does it mean to have a vision for the lostness in your city, to, to ensure that your vision and your, your, your uh, preparing and your launching and your establishing and your repeating always focused on making sure that every man, woman, and child has repeated opportunity to hear, see, and respond to the gospel. So that will be our time next week.